So let's talk about managing anticoagulation and thrombosis remotely. We're going to use a case-based uh, approach. Uh, our next case uh, is about perioperative anticoagulant management, something that uh, in my experience has been very much the wild west out there. And so often it is dumped onto the primary care uh, physician, for example, when the dentist calls and how to manage that. Uh, so in this case, we've got a 74-year-old patient with a uh, atrial fibrillation and a CHADS-2 score of 4, uh, taking a DOAC, and he's got a flare of inflammatory osteoarthritis that he tells you about on the phone that's been bothering him for the last two weeks. It's been bothering him to the point where he's having difficulty with his activities of daily living. Uh, just walking around the house is causing him a lot of pain. Uh, you really don't want to use a non steroidal anti inflammatory drug uh, in this individual who's on an anticoagulant, and he's been using Tylenol himself uh, without much improvement. So, in the past, you've injected his knee and he's gotten a good response to it. And on the phone, he's asking if you can inject it again, and you agree to an office visit for uh, injecting uh, interarticular steroid into this man's uh, left knee. But what about that uh, direct acting oral anticoagulant that he's on? How should it be managed? Jim, can I turn this one over to you? Sure, thank you, Alan. And this is, as Alan said, a very germane problem that is very common, especially in a primary care setting. And really there are two types of patients that we're dealing with. The first type is a patient such as this, who you want to do a procedure in your office, uh, hopefully sooner than later. And then the second situation is a patient that you're caring for who is scheduled to have an elective procedure or surgery. And we know that in many hospitals, some of those uh, situations are starting to be ramped up. So back to this patient, in all cases of managed perioperative, or in this case, periprocedural management, the anchoring point is to ascertain or estimate a patient's procedure-related bleeding risk. Now, there isn't any standardized way to do this, but the uh, application through Thrombosis Canada that you see on your right there provides you with a bit of a roadmap to help you stratify patients according to their risk for bleeding and whether that is high risk in patients having a major surgery, uh, lower moderate risk patients having a less invasive surgery, or a low to minimal risk involving a large number of patients who are having procedures uh, such as a uh, intra-articular injection, in this case of a corticosteroid, uh, or other procedures, whether they are dental, uh, skin biopsies, angiography, cataract surgery. So that guide will help you to stratify that your patient. And of course, there are, will be individual factors. For example, everybody that's having a dental procedure is not the same. Dental cleaning is different from a root canal. It's different from somebody having multiple extractions with poor underlying dentition. The thing to remember, though, in all of these patients who are receiving a direct anti oral anticoagulant is that there is a simple sort of approach, and this is based on what's called the PAUSE study, which was just recently published about a year ago. And the rule of thumb, if you want to remember anything from this case, is that if a patient is on a DOAC and they're having a low to moderate risk for bleeding procedure, they have they stop their anticoagulant, their direct anticoagulant for one day. So one day off, and then they take nothing the day of the procedure. If they're having a procedure or surgery associated with a high bleeding risk, then we simply add a day, so two days off before and nothing on the day of the procedure. The only exception to that rule is patients who are on dabigatran and have impaired renal function because this drug is cleared by the kidney predominantly, we add one or two extra days of interruption. In this particular situation, there may be an argument that you don't have to interrupt anticoagulation at all. The only caveat is that as we mentioned earlier, 
DOACs act very quickly. So if I'm going to take my DOAC in the morning, my peak effect is going to be one to three hours later. So it's probably not a good idea to tell your patient, okay, take your DOAC in the morning and come by to my office later that morning and we'll, we'll give you the injection. You may, in this particular instance, want to tell that patient, you know what, either skip your DOAC for this day or take it at supper or at bedtime. So overall, you want to assess the patient based on their risk for bleeding with the surgery, or in this case, the procedure. There is a tool on Thrombosis Canada that provides you a bit of a roadmap. We lost. So you want to just wait a bit before giving them the DOAC around the time of the procedure. I think we can go to the next slide in, the, in our next case, and we can come back if there are questions regarding periprocedural management, because there's a lot of potential uh, scenarios that can be involved. Uh, on behalf of Thrombosis Canada, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's program. Uh, I'd like to express thanks also to Dr. Ducatis and uh, Dr. Castellucci for their um, excellent presentations and answers to your questions. I also would like to thank our sponsor, Bear Canada, for their unrestricted grant for this program. And be sure to visit our website regularly and often as we add new materials all the time and are always updating our clinical guides and tools. So uh, with that, I wish you all uh, a safe, uh, uh, afternoon and safety throughout the rest of uh, COVID. Bye-bye now.